Good evening. Welcome to Edisto High School. My name is Alexis King. I'm the principal here at Edisto, and we are so glad and happy to have you here with us tonight, all of you members of our community. We thank you for taking the time out, those that are here and those that are viewing online, to take part in this occasion as we present this information. We thank Dr. Foster, our superintendent, members of cabinet, our board members, other friends that are here that are taking part in this so, you, so that you can um, give your input, ask questions, so that we can continue to move forward in this wonderful endeavor. Thank you again for coming and visiting with us here at Edisto High School, and if there's anything we can ever do for you, please let us know. Thank you, Ms. King, and again, welcome. Um, I, I try to be respectful of everyone's time and start at, at 6.30. Uh, I'm gonna try to cover this whole gym to make sure that I'm giving everybody their due attention. Um, but again, we're here to share information, but more importantly, to get feedback. Um, that, that's the first thing that I, that I want to ensure. So we've had uh, about 50 plus meetings already. And um, you have an opportunity to hear feedback, whether formal or informal. But it also gives us an opportunity to get better at our presentation, but also dispel things that are happening. Um, as I expressed to many people that this is a practice in getting feedback on a proposed plan. The first time we came out to the community, we brought forth data. We brought forth information in regards to what the demography study um, showed us, but also what our facility study showed us as well. We took that information and we were able to look at our resources, our opportunities, and come back and do exactly what we were asked of during those meetings, to come back with a plan. Because we were asked, what's the plan? And our response was simple, there is no plan. That wasn't the intent. So we're here to bring back a plan to give additional feedback. So I also say that to say this, you hear whether it's a done deal, this, this, that. If that's the sentiments that people share and they don't want to get their input, I don't know how else to ask for their feedback. This in no shape, form, or fashion is a Dr. Foster, a school board, or a district administration's plan because the plan hadn't been approved. And as you'll see in this presentation, the actual motion that the board actually approved is here. And we'll show you exactly what that motion read and what we're doing is exactly what we're doing here. So again, we've had 50 plus meetings, but we're now um, engaged in our large community. We've had an opportunity to meet with the gym, the delegation. We've had an opportunity to meet with the mayors, faith-based advisory members. Um, had two meetings today with the afternoon rotary, um, and also with our district level staff, we had an opportunity to engage all of our school communities to ensure that they also are informed as to what the plan is and what the process is. But in addition to that, we had a number of individual and small group meetings as well. Um, and again, we're here. As superintendent, it's my role and responsibility and obligation to stand before this community and present information and engage this community for their feedback. So that's what we're gonna do. We um, kind of coined this, this tour um, as School Improvements of Pride for 2025. Um, and you'll understand why we, we targeted the year 2025, which is a very um, aggressive and optimistic goal if approved to help see and show um, improvements to not only our school facilities, but I don't want people to get caught up in the conversation of bricks and mortar. I, I don't want that to happen because that in essence is a secondary purpose. Our primary purpose is also to enhance the program and options and opportunities for students to provide the best quality education we can provide. While being sure that we're, we're being good stewards of taxpayers' dollars in the process. So please, you hear a lot about bricks and buildings, but the conversation is more about what opportunities can we provide to students as well. So, as I mentioned earlier, this is what the board actually approved. In January, this was the actual request of the administration, and that was to join the district administration in bringing forth the shared solutions in this presentation for community, to the community for their input and feedback. That's what the board approved. That's the actual official motion in the minutes 
we did not ask the board to approve us to go tell the people what the plan was. So I just want to make sure we're clear in that regard as to what we are and where we're doing, as we did before. We go out to the community, get feedback, take that information, and then we come back with a plan. Since I've, since I've been here as superintendent, I said one thing about communication. It's a three-step process. You tell people what you're going to do, you update them on the process, and then you come back and tell them when it's done. If you miss any of those stages, I feel like you haven't properly communicated. Again, tell them what you're going to do. We're updating you on the process. But at some point, I'll have to come forth for a full recommendation after we've considered things for the board to consider. So that's where we are. So just to recap, again, we had 60 plus meetings here, some, some snapshots of those official meetings that we had to talk about the demography study, to talk about the facility study. In addition, all this information has been posted online under our operations tab in the school district for over here. So please, I encourage you, as I did last time, to go in and read the details, read the final lines, and give us your feedback. You have an opportunity to do that at the close of this session. But just to recap, we had a full-scale demography study done, and in that demography study, it, took, it showed us some things that were not surprising, but it just confirmed some things. That during the study, we had a live birth um, study done that basically said, okay, we have fewer babies being born in Orangeburg County. So in five years later, you can expect that five more, fewer students will be enrolled in kindergarten, which has contributed to the decline in enrollment in many of our schools. But additionally, you know the census data that was just released for the 2020 census, it showed us that we lost 8.9% of our population here in Orangeburg. That is the highest percentage of population decrease in the state of South Carolina. That is the largest percentage of decrease in population in the state of South Carolina, and that's verified also by the, the um, Commerce Office in Columbia. I mean, the first presentation I actually showed the slide from their presentation showing that the decrease in our actual population. But also, countywide, a brand new countywide consolidated school district, at a maximum capacity, we have the opportunity to serve 28,000 students. Currently, we have 11,000. So you can imagine that puts us at about a 39% utilization versus occupation district-wide. Yet still, when this study was done, we spent $3.1 million to turn the lights on. That does not include water. That does not include repairs. This is $3.1 million that we used to turn the lights on. And I need to remind everyone, this was when we were completely perfect. After school activities were not functioning. So therefore, you can expect this number is going to be significantly higher now that we transition back to five-day face-to-face instruction and continue our extended programs. But also, the demographer also said if we're, we're continuing to trend in this direction by 2030, we could see around 8,000 students in this school district, 11 and now. So taking all of those into consideration, live birth data and the census data, they were able to forecast these things. And I want to reference the actual accuracy of the demography study. We were told then that the estimated population um, decrease in Northbrook County was going to be about 8.7%. This was prior to the census data being released. So I was extremely excited when I realized that the census official data came out and they were 8.9%. So that's a, a, a really, really narrow error of margin there, which validates the accuracy of the actual demography study. We also had a facility study run parallel with our demography study, and the architect LS3P they looked at our schools and they rated them in categories. Those that are in need of minor or few repairs, those that were in need of moderate to more extensive repairs, but also looked at those that were in need of major repairs. As you see here, those that were in need of few repairs were some of your newer facilities here, Lake Marion, Franksville Lock, and Bethune Bowman. But in the yellow, we have a, a, a wider span, so some of those facilities were in need of moderate to even more extensive repairs. But if you look at the pink area, those were our facilities that are in need of major repair. Um, you'll hear later about a full-scale um, audit that we had done on our mechanical systems. And we had 2,200 mechanical systems evaluated. 
And of those 2,200, 2,006 of them, 91% were beyond their lifespan, district-wide, with some reaching a potential catastrophic failure. So we also had an opportunity, as I mentioned earlier, to ask for feedback. We had about 150 comments um, that were taken through a survey pool, and you'll have the opportunity as well to do that here today um, on this particular plan. So here's some comments, and we took them in their raw form. So please don't hold me accountable for any edits. I didn't want to change anything. I can copy and paste them as they were. So if it's a misspelled word or something, please don't say the student didn't know how to spell. I, I took it in the rare form there. But here, you can hear, I'm not going to read them to you. It says, you know, I think this is leading to school closures, in my opinion. I think the district should close Red Pond, Brookdale, Vance Primary. We can take these schools and use them for homework centers. These were just my ideas that were provided. The majority of these comments came from actual employees in the building. So here's the first proposed solution. I want to make sure that I highlight the first word proposed. Again, the intent of these meetings is to come out to the community bring forth a plan as I was asked to do before, but also get feedback. So the proposed solution here is to look at Lake Marion campus, if you've been there, and turn that into a K through 12th grade campus. Now I want to be clear, I didn't say a K through 12th grade school. If you see here represented in the blue, this is a completely separate elementary school. Separated from the high school, it has its own playground area, stacking, parking, Everything has its own cafeteria, media center, kitchen. It's a completely separate building. It's just on the campus of Lake Marion High School. If you've been to Lake Marion High School, it has, it has a ton of land um, there that can, can be utilized. But also, up here is the yellow 20 classroom addition. That is proposed um, addition would house the middle school portion and utilize existing portions of the high school there to bring all six, seven, and eighth grade students over to Lake Marion High School. So that is the first proposed solution. So here's what a, a draft sketch of the building could look like if this is approved. And this sketch is actually transposed on the actual Lake Marion site. You see the water tower there. Because an architect had to make sure that it was to scale and we could actually fit a building to serve 12 to 1400 elementary school students in this particular site. You see here again, as I mentioned, we have a dining, kitchen, media center. This is a separate school facility, and I want to make sure that I reiterate that. Um, as many people thought that, well, they're going to make it a K-12. However, in Orangeburg County, K-12 are multi-level campuses. It's not anything new to us. We have North, that's a 6th through 12th grade campus. Ellery is a K-8. We have Branchville Lockett, which is a K-12. We have HKT, which is K-12, bethune Bowman. So we have historically done multi-level schools, and we've done them fairly well. So to have a 6th through 12th grade campus um, as proposed at Lake Mary would not be new to the school district. However, by building a new facility, the proposed plan is to take these four existing facilities, Ellery, St. James, Holly Hill, and Vance, and move those students into that one facility at the high school where students in the east automatically go for their high school career. So we're looking to transition all of those students to where high school students would go, making that a K-12 campus. So we asked the actual architects to put a dollar figure to what it would cost to bring these facilities up to a minimum standard. But we also, again, wanted to run the actual utilization and the occupancy parallel to that. So Ellery, for instance, it will cost us $14 million to bring Ellery up to a minimum standard I want to make sure that I, I, I include that caveat. This is a minimum standard. And currently, it sits at 26%. St. James sits at 34%, and it will cost us $5.5 million to bring it up to a minimum standard. Likewise, Holly Hill will be $11 million. They're currently at 34% occupancy in advance, another $11.3 million, and they're at 31% capacity. Or we can build a brand new facility to serve at about 80% capacity, which allows room for growth on that existing campus where we currently own land. We currently have the adequate utilities to build a scale, uh, build at this scale. Here's a proposed timeline, if this is approved. Look at March 2022, you would look at design phase, February of 23, groundbreaking, 
I'm going to close those schools on June the 24th with that hope to open up the new building for the 24-25 school year. So if there's a circumstance where we have weather conditions that are not favorable or supply chain issues, it's been known that you can add another six months on and move in in a January timeline as well. So there's some fluff building there. And again, this is an extremely aggressive construction schedule, but that would be our goal and our expectation is to have these again. School and improvements are prized by 2025. The proposed middle school wing, this um, building is actually attached to Lake Barrett, as I mentioned earlier. This is a two-story, 20 classroom addition to serve around four to 500 students. And it would be here on the right left, you see a rendering of what that potential building could look like. Um, so the question becomes, well, Dr. Foster, Lake Barrett is a pretty big building. It was built for 1,400 students. You only have 700 in there. Why can't you just move the middle and high school students over there and leave it like it is? Why do I need an addition? So the truth is, we could do that. It is large enough to house all those students. However, not only are we looking at capacity of students, we also have to look at transition. Because that was built originally for a high school, if we are allowed to add this addition, it gives us an opportunity to separate students as well, so a sixth grader doesn't necessarily have to coincide with a 12th grader. But I mentioned earlier that this is also about students, mostly. It's not about brick and mortar. So here's the opportunity to now share a, a live story that disclosed one foot from my family. When I first moved here, when I first took the job here, I had to leave my daughter in her existing middle school in Anchor. Because my daughter had the opportunity and was currently enrolled in algebra two as an eighth grader, and in Spanish two as an eighth grader. Now I want to make sure I had that correct, it's Spanish two as an eighth grader because she took Spanish one as a seventh grader. So I could not offer her that option here in Orangeburg because we didn't offer Spanish two in any of our middle schools. But given a circumstance in a scenario like this, where they have Spanish two at Lake Barron High School for a student who's ready to soar, so that student is able to walk down the hallway and have an opportunity for those options if they're ready to soar. We can't drive them across the county where we don't have a Spanish 2 teacher in middle school. But the same thing applies for Algebra 1, English 1. So it's, again, this conversation is not just about bricks and mortars, it's about enhancing opportunities for students. For those that are ready to soar, they can soar. But for those that need additional support, we can also leverage our resources there and provide the additional support for those students in this process. So here, Holly Hill Roberts Middle School, to bring it up to a minimum standard will cost us about $19 million. They're currently at a 32% occupancy. There's a technology wing at that school that is not even used at all in stores. Not to include the other empty spaces at Holly Hill Roberts Middle School. But also, Ella Reed, the middle school portion there is at a 26% capacity. We have about 130 middle school kids, grades 6 to 8, at Holly Hill, at Ella Reed Middle School. It'll cost us about $7 million to bring that up. We can build this wing, and we would be at about a 65 to 75% utilization with this plan. The actual proposed timeline is similar to the actual elementary school, which they hope to move in for the 24 25 school. So again, some other responses. I'm not going to belabor this and read them to you all. Again, this will be posted online as well. But um, the information was informative and we recognize that change is going to be painful. But we look forward to what is in store for the district and the students, teachers, administrators, and stakeholders. Again, these are the actual comments that we received from our first round of meetings. The next proposed solution is a brand new Owensburg Books and High School off of the current site where it exists now. So I said this since the beginning when I got here. I'm just going to tell it like it is, and I think that's what people deserve. Um, maybe it'll get me in trouble, maybe it won't. But I hopefully people will understand and appreciate the fact that I'll be candid with them. Is Orangeburg Wilson High School is, in the scheme of things, not a very old facility. However, the deferred maintenance on that facility has driven the cost through the roof of the city that it cost me about $54 million to upgrade this facility. So as I've done my research, they had a proposed um, 
renovations that the mechanical units, the HVAC units, prior to consolidation when they were shipping. And they had a budget of being up around $9 million. At that time, years ago, the actual estimate came in around $12 million. That's why it was never addressed. And we have some members who were here present during that time. So you can only imagine what that cost is coming. So again, I'll show you where that, that breakdown comes. But this is a comprehensive high school to, to consist of classroom spaces, parking, athletic facilities. Uh, again, on a site that we're trying to identify right now. So here's what a, a, a rendering could look like of the new Orange Grove Wilson High School next to the actual site plan. Um, for, for this individual facility. Again, $53,986,500 is the estimate to bring this facility up to a minimum standard according to the architect. And I want to reemphasize minimum standard. That would not bring it up to today's actual code, but it would bring it up to a, a better situation. So I've asked this question a number of times when I talk about investing money into our existing facilities. The question becomes, if we were to invest this, this, this type of money, am I going to get another 60 years out of that facility? I believe that's a fair question to ask. With my investment, would I get an additional 50, 60 years by bringing these facilities up to a minimum standard? The design and uh, proposed um, schedule is similar to what we've showed for the Lake Marion High School and the um, elementary school addition in the eastern part of the county. Again, some additional responses. Um, some schools need to merge. If updates or repairs cannot be made, close the schools if possible. Again, you can, can read through those and again, we'll post this presentation for you to come through in a little more detail. The next proposed solution um, deals with our, our, our youngest population our primary age children, students in pre-K through second grade. If you're not familiar, right now, Edisto Primary and Revlon Elementary Schools are the only two schools in the school district that service students in pre-K through second grade. And if you drive about three miles from the primary school, you will run into Revlon Elementary School. So right now, Revlon, um, if we were to bring it up to a minimum standard, would be 14 million dollars they're currently at a 44% occupancy right now. But if you know anything about Edisto Primary, right now there's 17 empty classrooms at Edisto Primary. There's a whole wing at Edisto Primary that is unutilized to include the additional classrooms that are there. So the 189 students that we have at Revlon would all fit in those 17 classrooms and I would still have empty classrooms at Edisto Primary. Additionally, we have slated at Edison Primary to do painting and some floor repairs because we're able to receive some grant funds from USDA that we're going to do anyway. The question becomes, will those nice new classrooms be empty or will they have students in them? Because that's where those funds have to go and be, be utilized. We're able to paint and do flooring projects in nine of our schools just this summer. So this is the next one along with two other facilities that we're going to be doing some upgrades on. So again, this transition is a, is a little bit different. Not next year, but the following year, starting for the 2023-24 school year, we would then look to do renovations this summer at Edison Primary, have activities with the faculty, the staff, and the students to hopefully transition those students over to Edison Primary School and have one primary school to service our students in pre-K through second grade uh, in a facility that I believe everybody can be, can be proud of. Again, some additional responses are here. Um, one says, particularly, I believe we should look at schools with low student populations, 250 students or less. These are, again, just comments and, and suggestions that we were able to receive from our first round of meetings. So the next proposed solution is to build a 20 classroom addition to Clark. You're familiar with Clark and Howard, they sit about two miles apart, and they both serve the students in grades six through eighth grade currently. So by adding that, we would then take the students from Howard, transition those students into Howard, having one little school in one property. 
So you see here um, a site plan, but also you see a, a schematic drawing. Um, if you drive down Boulevard Street, you'll see that new addition, which will mirror the newest part of Clark. So you say, Dr. Foster, why do you choose Clark? Because um, Clark was on the list for more extensive repairs. Well, we made some significant improvements and investments in Clark. Clark has a brand new roof that has just been put on. It's been completely repainted, completely refloored. And with the other opportunities that we are presenting for our mechanical upgrades, we have made a significant investment to bring that school up to standard. We've also put new brand new windows in every single window in Clark. So again, that's why the location and the significant investment that we've already made to bring our facilities up. Speaking of painting facilities, this facility was one of the facilities that was painted inside and outside. As you look around, this complete building was recently painted just last summer. So again, nine facilities we were able to address. Right now, Howard is at 35% occupancy, moving over to Clark would put Clark around at 65% occupancy as well. But I need to add something to you. We would also have to look at the actual stacking and the site plan at Clark as well. As you drive by Clark at three during this missile, uh, it's like a Chinese service out there. Because there's a lot of cars everywhere. Um, and for a safety measure, this would also give us an opportunity to address those things. You know, schools that were built years ago, kids rode the bus. Now, I have parents that car pick up line at 12 o'clock and school doesn't dismiss until three. Because they're trying to beat the line. So more and more, more students are being transported via car. Again, this timeline mirrors the um, proposed solution in the eastern part of the county with a opening date of year 2024-25 school year. Again, some other responses that, that, that you see here, and I'm gonna pause and hear some, some really good ones that uh, we've had some people submit. Combining Brookdale and Whitaker Elementary Schools, combining St. James and Holly Hill, combining Vance and El Reed, Moon Holly and Roberts, and El Reed Middle to Lake Marion High School, or build a new middle school within the Santee area. So they, they put some thought into that actual response. And that actually came from an employee. That's, I was in a school visiting one day, and she actually came up and said, well, this was my response. A 37-year veteran teacher actually said, I get it. I grew up in this community. It pains me, but I see what our kids are lacking. And I believe we need to make the commitment to those students. So what do you do with Howard? Just like Clark, we made significant investments in Howard as well. Howard also has a brand new roof. We were able to paint the entire building through a partnership with Leadership South Carolina just last year. So we began to make the significant improvements and investments into Howard as well. Nevertheless, where Howard is actually located, right on the main thoroughfare, is about a mile from Brookdale. If I pick up a rock and I throw it far enough, I'll be able to hit Whitaker Elementary School two miles down the road is Mellishan. So the proposed solution here is to continue the upgrades and renovations at Howard while moving those three elementary schools, Whitaker, Brookdale, and Mellishan, which will cost about $18 million to bring Whitaker up, 9.6 for Brookdale, and 6.7 for Mellishan. We can bring all those students into a renovated Howard Elementary School or Elementary School or whatever name is chosen and still be at about 75% occupation versus utilization. So this timeline is a little different. Remember I talked about Clark and having to build the actual wing on Clark, move Howard students into Clark, but then we would need a year or so to complete any renovations to turn this into an elementary school. So this is delayed a year. So the proposed plan is to begin this transition for the 25-26 school year for the elementary school students who are currently attending Whitaker um, so additionally, this is the part that, again, we need to address everybody. I've said since I got here, every student deserves a high-quality education experience. Doesn't matter where you live, doesn't matter how much money you have or don't have, it doesn't matter who your mom or dad is, that applies to every single child. So another part of this proposed solution is to look at our athletic facilities, our fine arts facilities, but also our playgrounds at our elementary schools, those existing. So at, what you see here, actually, I believe that's Edisto High School, is a rendering of what an astroturf field could look like. Upgrades to our 
weight rooms, and I've had someone come in and say, Dr. Foster, I don't know if a weight room is a wise investment. I think that's wasting money. And I had to look the young man in his eyes, and I said, you know, being an assistant principal at Norman High School, where I spent four years, being a principal at Sparkford High School, I'm keenly aware of what students have access to in regards to resources to make sure that they're in shape to compete on a turf where that may be the only ticket to college. For me, if it wasn't for a football scholarship, I wouldn't be standing here as superintendent of Warren County School District. But when I put a child on a plain surface, whether it be a basketball court, a wrestling match, a football field, and they're not adequately prepared, which student runs the risk of getting hurt? The one that has the adequate resources or the one that doesn't? So at that point, I may be taking away an opportunity for a student to extend their educational career by not giving them a high quality education. But as we stand in this auditorium, every single student may not be academically gifted. They may not be athletically inclined. But we have a ton of students who are gifted in the performing and visual arts. So as you look around here, I believe upgrading lighting and sound would be something that would enhance the experience of a child who's gifted in drama. Those things have to be addressed if we're going to say we're going to commit to all students and make sure all students have their platform to display their individual talents. But playgrounds, I had an opportunity to speak to Rotary this, this morning, this, this afternoon, and I explained to them the significance of a playground. You know, to a kindergartner, the best time is on the playground. But you know, a playground is bigger than just somewhere to play. I'm a firm believer that the lack of these type of opportunities have contributed to, I believe, much of where we are as a country. Because I recall and I remember watching kindergartners and first graders on a playground develop friendships, engage in those small conversations. But when their friend falls off the monkey bars and they run over and they have compassion, they help them off the ground. Those intrinsic things that we want to develop good citizens and human beings, they miss those opportunities. The care for human life is developed at a young age in authentic, real life opportunities. So it's a bigger picture. And I try my best as superintendent not to be narrow-minded and, and look at it from a tunnel vision. I have to see the gains because that to me is just as significant as math, reading, writing, to develop the core part of, it, of the human being and the core caring that I believe we need to instill in all of our students. So these are just some other um, opportunities and then we would sit down and start to develop a scope of work that would need to be done at each site. Some things would be consistent across all sites, but some schools may not need certain things, but may need others. You know, I can tell you about the baseball facility at Edisto High School because I've talked to the maintenance and operations department. I know that's been a request for upgrades. That may be something that we have to address here outside of some of the things that, again, may be consistent across the board. That can start in January of 23 and hopefully be completed again on August of 2025. So here's the, the, the big question. Well, Dr. Foster, if I count correctly, you're talking about impacting nine, ten facilities. So what happens to those existing facilities? So I'll tell you this, there's nothing more to pain than when I drive, when I was driving in from Aiken, and I was driving down North Road, and I was seeing over at School there. That's an eyesore. So one thing that can't happen is that. We can't leave schools to be old abandoned eyesores in our communities. But I think if we're creative, and we leverage the resources and the care of this community, we're able to establish some private and public partnerships to utilize those facilities. So for one, they extend services to our children and our community, but two, you also have an opportunity to leave a footprint of history in that community. So Dr. Foster, what do you mean by that? 
I've used this example a few times. Holly Hill Elementary School used to be an old high school. They have a full-size gymnasium. They have a full-size cafeteria, full-size kitchen. You know, there's not a week that goes by that we don't get a request from some outside organization wanting to rent a facility for a number of reasons. Family gatherings, funerals, sadly enough. Um, but in rural areas, one challenge that we have is there are no large-scale facilities to utilize in those areas. I've been asked, and I've had a meeting with the recreation folks down in the eastern part of the county about recreation sports. What a great opportunity to tear parts of the building that are no longer useful, make it more efficient, partner with the city or the county municipality there and say, hey, it's yours. You have a gymnasium, you have a cafeteria, you have a kitchen, and now it becomes a revenue source, but also a resource for that entire community. There are options there. But I've also said this. Someone said, Dr. Foster, you're taking all of our schools. And I had to say, you know, school building, I get it. But a school building brick and mortar is not a building, it's not a school until you put children in. If you travel across this state now, you may have to drive past an old school building that's now an apartment complex because the developers went in and revitalized that school for workforce housing. I was having a conversation with the gentleman right here just earlier about people driving in. The honest reality is many people drive in because there's nowhere to live. There's no workforce housing. And I know that without a shadow of a doubt because I live myself. I would have been in this county a lot sooner, but I had to resort to building my own home, which put me and my children on the road for you, driving back and forth. So I get it. So there are opportunities there to address gaps in our basic economic structure, but also utilize our facilities and, and enhance our community partnerships and private partnerships. So those are just a few um, things. And again, I don't have all the answers. My hope is that maybe someone puts forth some other recommendations. I did this presentation with the faith based group, and they said, Without caution, we may be looking to partner with some other churches if it goes through, and we can take a gymnasium and we can make it our lifestyle. So, at the end of the day, I say this, and I don't vacillate on it from 7 to 4 o'clock. Our teachers and our employees do a great job of wrapping their arms around children and loving them, even those that may be hard to love sometimes. They do it every single but I'm convinced that we lose many of our children from four to when their parents get home from work because we have nowhere for them to go. So they go to the streets. So if we can imagine having a place, I see Mr. Gatson over here, a place where he tries to mentor individuals. If he had a place where we could have those individuals every single evening, as opposed to them walking down the street and making a poor choice. How does that help me as a superintendent? It gives me a child ready to learn the next morning. The drama that may be created from that poor decision, our principals don't have to deal with in the school buildings, and we can concentrate on educating our children. That's the big picture of this. It's just not about buildings. It's just not about bricks and mortar. It's about a comprehensive program to bring up our students, which in turn brings up our kids. So here's how you do this, Dr. Foster. We would have to go out for a referendum in November of 2022 for about $190 million. So I'm going to let you read that bottom section as it sits. Mr. Walker, did you bring any handouts of the actual debt profile? So we're going to post online our debt portfolio. For those of you who, Mr. Rudd, you've been on the school boards, you understand how this works. There's the operation side of the budget, but it's also the debt service side of the budget. Right now, on the debt service side, you pay 42 meals on debt service. So when we're separate, the old um, 
four. I have it right here, actually, because I met with our financial advisor, but I wanted to get the actual accurate debt service millage. The old district three paid 62 mills, 62.5 to be exact. The old four paid 49 mills. It was the old five that paid 30 mills. Hence is, I believe, why some of the actual facilities were, were in that state. So when people say my taxes are going up, actually, in this particular area, they were reduced to 42 mills. Those are the facts. You can reach out to Compass, and um, I'm sure Ms. Rudd will go back through old records, and you can see the actual debt service millage that we paid. So here's how you do this. Right now, um, our debt service schedule has us making payments um, next year of about $8 million on the debt service. So that comes off. The following year, $7 million. 25, 26, I believe we're down to $450,000. Both of those years at that point, all of our debt has been paid off. So the $14 million that we get off 8% debt money that we're going to get anyway, we get it every year. We take that and you pay the debt service loans off. It's typically how we're doing now. So this is not going to have a tax increase of any sort. You maintain the debt service limit at 42 bills, and instead of getting $14 million over the next 20 years, you advance the $190 million and you make that payment. You may say, well, Dr. Foster, in that case, why don't you get more money? Because at that point, once you exceed that number, then you begin to impact taxes. And our goal was to back into the amount, amount of money we can get to make sure we have the impact to do the projects that we need to do for this community. So that's how that works. And I know that was the quick overview of that. Um, and just as a note, the $14 million that we actually um, levy for debt service, we don't use our entire 8%. We're actually able to get 24, 24 million on the debt service side. But the board is cognizant of taxpayers that they only access 14 million. Because if they were to go up to 24 million, your taxes would double. And there's no vote needed for that. That's in their constitutional debt minimum rights. But again, to ensure that we are good stewards of taxpayer dollars considering we go in and try to do the best we can do with what we have. So the board also approved um, another mechanism because again, 2006 of our mechanical units, of the 2200 mechanical units are beyond their lifespan. There are times where your classroom is hotter than it is outside or colder because it's just not working. Maintenance works and they do a, a heck of a job, but sometimes they just can't get parts. And quite frankly, they get wore out and criticized for not doing anything when they're doing their very best. When you have units at this age, they don't make parts for some of the units anymore. And I've known them to go on eBay and every other method this gentleman can take it just to try to get parts. And oftentimes, they're not successful. So by using an energy performance contract, this allows us to go in and replace those old outdated mechanical units, lighting, looking at water conservation as means of energy savings. So typically what happens is, just like um, the $3.1 million that we spent, by putting in more efficient units, your power bill goes down. So the money you're gonna spend in sending to Dominion or DPU, you take that to pay off the special obligations loan. This also is no impact to taxpayers as well, but it gives us an opportunity to find savings on energy, on parts, and all of those things. So it's called a guaranteed performance contract for a reason, and I've done this before in a prior life. That if any payment is not, if the savings don't generate enough to make the payment, the company pays the difference. That's how it works. It happens in all school, in a ton of school districts across the country because we're not the only school district that is faced with many of the challenges because oftentimes in South Carolina, maintenance is a local responsibility. So a way to not tax taxpayers is to do certain greater things like this in performance contracts. Again, 
We proposed in January 22 this plan. The board approved us only to go out and seek funding options, but also to negotiate and look at terms and conditions. So that's where we are. So once that's done, we'll bring forth the final terms and conditions and financing mechanisms to the board for final approval. Nothing is finally approved until we've confirmed all of those, those documents with our financial advisors who we work with, Compass Municipalities, right now. So that's where we are. We moved into the next phase with the hope that by August, we can start seeing some of those things being changed out and change the working and learning conditions for our students in all of our facilities. Just a reminder, um, again, here are the dates. We're here today. But um, if you just enjoyed this so much, come on out tomorrow to Bethune Bowling. If you enjoyed it more, then come on out next week because we'll be in three different locations next week. Lovely Hill Baptist Church, Lake Mary, and then Orangeburg. Um, Wilson High School to really engage our, our, our community. I, I close with this slide and, and you know I don't have a script for this because it just comes to me. Um, I just speak from the heart. So I'm here knowing that this is a very controversial and, and uncomfortable conversation. That at best I might get my goal as superintendent is to get everyone to agree, and I have failed at that role every single day that I've been the superintendent in Orangeburg. But I get up the next day and try to make sure that everybody comes to a consensus. Truth be told, I've been told by people in this county and outside this county, Dr. Foster, don't touch that. Leave that alone. Superintendents don't survive those things. And again, if I have to be honest, I've contemplated saying, let it be. But I'm reminded of a few things, and I'm reminded of my testimony that I've shared a number of times. You know, being a stage four cancer survivor three years ago, I felt like I was left here for something. I had other opportunities to, to lead other school districts, but something led me here. And when I see these young people every day, when they run up to me and they hug me, I'm reminded of why I'm here. When I have to hug a teacher who's in tears because she has a classroom that is just not suitable for her to provide adequate instruction that she's stayed up late nights preparing for a lesson and it just doesn't turn out the way that he or she wishes. It's why I'm bringing forth a proposed option to increase the opportunities for not only our students and our teachers, but also for this community. I've tried to turn over every stone possible, look at every data point, even down to all the way going back to 2014, every school district that has passed a bond referendum, some increasing taxes. And the sad thing is, Everybody around us, they've taken that step. And subsequently, we're now seeing the ramifications as people that border us, those nine counties that border Orangeburg County, and parents are able to drive across because they feel like they may get a better opportunity when, truth be told, the love and care and education they receive from my teachers in these buildings is second to none. I can say that because I have children that attend these schools and will not put them anywhere else. But it's because they made an investment in my children. Here's a link. And um, you may have gotten a card. If you click on this link, go to the QR code, it will take you to a survey that is broken down individually by every single proposed solution. I want your feedback. I've had 92 responses so far last time I checked the link. And we'll read through every single one of those responses. And we'll consider. I see folks from senior staff who are shaking their head, they get the same title as looking and reading through people's comments. 
because the decision has not been made despite what people may hear. We're not going to invest our time and energy for something that we already know. And I'm not going to waste yours. So please, 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 and I said this last time, go to the link, go to the survey, complete the survey, and give us your honest feedback. You may bring something forth that we're simply not aware of. But it's a consideration. But there's going to come a point that as superintendent, I'm obligated to bring forth a plan for our school board to consider. I have to land a plan at some point. And if that plan is to do nothing, then I've done my due diligence and I've given this community all the information that I felt they need. And we've made our mind up as to the direction we want to go for our children. I believe I owe this community that, but more importantly, I owe children. Someone said we got to cost $190 million, even though it's not costing us anything, that's too much money. And I said, you're right, it's a lot of money. I said, we can look at the cost of things, but we also got to look at who's paying the bill. And right now, our children are paying the bill, and they're writing a check with their lives. With the opportunities they will or would not be able to gain due to the lack of opportunities we were unable to. So yeah, there's a cost. But somebody has to pay the bill. Before I close, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize a few people here that work tirelessly to make tough decisions but also support this community um, as a representative. No, that's our school board members. I see Dr. Brunson, I see the Vice Chair, I see um, Chair Edwards, I see Mrs. Almer and Dr. Stevens, and I see Reverend Brown in the back as well. They can be doing other things, but they're here now. And many of them will travel along with us just to be available, but also to hear the comments of this community. There's not a day that goes by that conversation is not had with these ladies and gentlemen that's not sitting around children. But I'm also going to recognize Mr. Aaron Rudd here who served this school district for 48 years. Yeah. So he's a little better than me. I can't do 48 years. Um, I'm only 45. But thank you for your service as well, Mr. Rudd. But that's what we're here for. So please put your comments in, but I'll be more than to open up the floor for any questions and comments that you may have as well. Did we serve a total of how many years and as far as on the bill? 42 years. 42 years, yes, sir. Can you service all the debt on 42 bills? No, no. I'm, our village right now is 42 bills on debt service side. Yes, sir. We can service our debt now on the 42 bills. The 42 bills will bring in what, about 15 million? 42 bills brings around 14 million. And that was only assessed value. So in this actual plan, and I'm not going to get in the weeds, but um, our financial advisor in the actual 42 bills and the profile, um, assessments at about a 1% annual growth. So just last year, we moved 3.7%. So it's a very conservative growth number in that as well. And that's based off a 5% interest rate, which interest rates now are significantly lower than 5%. So those predictions are extremely conservative in that regard. And this also leaves about a million and a half in the debt service for maintenance and regular cycle maintenance as well. So we've been extremely strategic how we approach this financially. But again, in 2026, all of our debt will roll off completely. When? 2026. We'd like to have a burning question there. Yes, sir. Hold on one second. I just want to get the mic.
like a fan because we're streaming live. Uh, as I took it, there's no, um, or I missed it, there's no future use for Archibald Wilkinson High School. It's not going to be repurposed. So right, right now, that falls in the same category of, as the other facilities where we would get together and have those conversations for public-private partnerships as to how we utilize those facilities. So the truth be told is, will there potentially be some opportunities where there's not an option for a public-private partnership and some facilities have to be completely demoed? Yes, that, that's a reality. But I think we have to ensure that we research options for, first of all, community use to fill a void in this community for, for our students. I would, I would recommend at least one caution, though, and that is I don't think the district should put itself in the position of having to maintain those buildings in this, in this repurpose use or community involvement because if you do that, it's, it, it's a new point. So what he said, for those who are streaming, is that the district should not put itself in a position where we are having to maintain those facilities. That's not the intent. That's where the public private partnership comes in. If there's a developer that says, I would love to come in and we could give you this facility if you're going to guarantee to use it for work workforce housing and renovate it for apartments, that's an option. But they would maintain the cost and upkeep of that. So great, great point. So, I'm going to repeat that because I don't believe the mic was on. She says, you know, I have a, a, a child who needs special, who has special services and they were not able to attend their own school because the program was not at that school. So when you bring together those three schools, guess what happens? The access to that teacher that your child has to be bused over to is now in that facility. So again, and I'm glad you said that because this is not just about bricks and mortar. It's about programs and opportunities and access for children. So yes, ma'am, that would help. But also, it would help us in many regards with some of the teacher bases that we currently have. That's a consistent problem across this country, where because we're in separate buildings, I may have a classroom of 12 and 10 over here and a actual substitute at this building. Well, I can combine that and make it one class of 21, and then that child does not have to have a substitute. They have a certified teacher to provide the instruction, so it helps out in a number of ways. Okay, also, would it be measured set in for a parent like me whose child is transitioning to middle school, but I'm having second thoughts because of the differences with her and from, I would say, a normal child? Like, would, it, would more measures be put in place so, all children know they have their own genius and their own giftedness, um, and they have their own, own assets and needs. So, you know, but the reality is transitioning from elementary school to middle school, those things need to be put in place now. That's not something that we have to wait for this to happen. Do we do everything perfect every single day? No, ma'am. But we've got to get up every day and try to make sure that the things that we fall short on, we're putting those measures in place to improve. So transition things, I was a middle school principal as well. So I know what it feels like to get my sixth graders to come over and tour the school and get to look at a locker because that's all sixth graders care about is if they're gonna get a locker for the first time. To meet those teachers, to, to, to feel comfortable in that space, those transition things um, we need to be doing already for our elementary school. Okay, also when this is over, I would like to speak with you too. Yes, ma'am. Y'all probably have to stand in line, but I'm, I'm going to save you a spot. Anyone else? Yes, sir. All right, hello. Um, so I got a few questions to ask if you have a moment for those few questions. So what will this help with uh, the educators? Because I have two um, students, one's in 
as the elementary and ones in the middle school. Um, what we do about teachers or educators because they're having to do math online because there's not enough math teachers, what will this help by doing so? So great, great, great follow-up as I mentioned to her. By consolidating our resources, it gives us an opportunity to fill a void that's there for those those vacancies that we have. But we're not consolidating for the EDSA school district. It's just for the, let's say, inner city schools. So here's the reality. A teacher under contract in Orangeburg is a teacher in the Orangeburg County School District. So when there's an excess math teacher here, then that teacher, certified teacher, will be potentially at another school location. So this is not new. We do it all the time every single year. One thing this community doesn't know is last year in November, I closed down 71 positions. I closed 71 positions and we were able to do that through attrition. Now teachers were moving from building to building to fill those actual vacancies that we had long-term subcans. So the similar process would work to fill those vacancies across the county. But okay. great, great question. This has been going on since August. So it started in August, and we weren't informed until January. The um, they put a letter out saying that there was no math teachers, but they waited that long to inform the people of the community that there was no math teachers. And, and that very well may be the case. And there are a lot of things that happened that you may or may not be aware of. We still have 50 vacancies today. Um, now, the one thing that, that well, why, I, do you, why do you believe they're not coming to the this district? I don't believe they're not coming. There's just a shortage. So you have to realize three years ago we had 124 vacancies. So we made significant impacts in closing those actual vacancy gaps. But truth be told, we have school districts across this county that are sitting at almost 200. Richland one has 200 vacancies. So we're comparatively looking at a broad scale. We have 32 schools as a countywide school system. Now, to have one vacancy is not good, but when you put that in perspective, with 32 schools and 50 vacancies, you can see the impact. The, the challenge is, it's not distributed in uh, across the board, which okay. was posed as pose a challenge. All um, right, now, I've got another question off of that subject. Um, has there been any looking in for like solar farms in the schools to help um, offset some of the cost of energy? So we actually looked at that as part of our investment grade audit. Um, that was not a recommendation made. In Aiken County, I put in six of them, so I'm keenly aware of that. But it's a little more detailed than just saying we're gonna put up solar. Um, your substations have to be equipped to actually hold the actual energy. And again, that's not anything that we control. So there's some upgrades that have to be done in our utility infrastructure to hold some of those options when you look at solar and those types of things. But I'll tell you this, I'm not an advocate and I stand strong on this of putting solar panels on top of roofs. Um, it would have to be a space where it's off roof because if I do and I have a roof issue, I have to take the solar panel off, fix the roof, repay to put the solar panel back on. So there are options there, but yes, sir, that was part of it. But given the lack of the infrastructure from the substations, it, it wasn't a viable option here. Anymore. All right, and my last question is, so with the HVA systems um, updating, would that include all the schools in the district or just some schools? So right now it includes all the schools that were in this plan proposed to remain. Okay. So the schools that are in the plan that are not proposed to remain were excluded um, from that. Okay, is, um, as, uh, like, um, as the middle schools, they're eight, HVACs work sometimes and do not work? 15 of them. We had to get up and run in the summer. I can tell you, if you give me a billion, I can tell you the almost accurate number of, the, of those that don't work. So you're exactly right. So it, elim it eliminates that, that issue. Okay. Good question.
you have dressed some of them. Marshall and Sheridan are two of the old single women's. When we, and of course you have Howard, which you talked about renovating, and Clark, those schools, those are 70 year old schools, except for the new portion of Clark. And, and Howard, and Howard too. They're 70 year old schools. Um, Clark, the reason they have the new building there, the, one, the finger wings were actually held together by one inch rod with plates on it. That's why it, it had a substantial amount of renovation for the new building. But, you know, the, the when we renovated, we went through a $6 million renovation through the 2000s for the Orangeburg Five. None of the Orangeburg Five schools, we had facelifts, we had um, good buildings put on like OW, the exterior and so forth. But the infrastructure for those schools is still 70 year old school. And to do the, to, to renovate like a Howard or a Clark, those old wings doesn't make any sense because you still got terracotta pipe under these schools. So, I mean, you know, from a taxpayer standpoint and a facility standpoint, those half of those schools need to be wiped out and start over because of, because of the infrastructure of it. I mean, I would seriously take a, take a look at that. Um, I would love to have a brand new facility. Trust me. Yeah. Um, I can't do it for well for the impact that I'm having. Well, you know, it depends on how we use the money. Um, the thing about we're here at Edgestill High School, also in the early 80s, Calhoun High School, OW High School. Let, and let, let me do this for a second. Let me ask you. Then, because I, I don't want to lose your question, yeah. and then we'll move to the next one. The infrastructure. So you're exactly right. Um, back in '97, um, whenever they, they did the those things, some of the resources that are provided now were not, were not available, such as E-rate dollars. E-rate dollars actually used for upgrading cabling in buildings, and um, it's reimbursed at a 90% reimbursement rate. Um, so those options now that are available. We have a significant V-rate plan to upgrade the infrastructure of some of those existing buildings now that those options are available. So that will address the wiring and not just cost, but some of our newer facilities to make sure that we're not on cat five cable that we're keeping up with the actual infrastructure needs of facilities here. So utilizing those things, our USDA opportunities are now available that were not available at those times. So again, this plan is never a criticism of a prior superintendent what they did or didn't do. Because the superintendent can only do what they have the option or opportunity to do during their time as superintendent. I'm just afforded the options to have the USDA, the E-Rex, the emergency connectivity funds that we now have an access to as well. So that will address those things. And again, this wouldn't be a snap of the light switch fix. It's a process that utilizing and leveraging all of our resources to make sure that we're extending the life of those facilities. So, next question. <clears throat> well, actually, in the mid 2000, we were utilizing a lot of the E-rate money that were around to upgrade a lot of our data wiring and stuff like that. So, District 5 was, was utilizing that. I'm not sure about the other two districts, three and four at the time, but I know District 5 was. So, we, we, we were early on in, in upgrading that. So, going with, with HBAC, with Calhoun, OW, and Eddie Study, they were built at the, roughly the same time. They still have the old water source heating and cooling system. This school right here, I know what was done at OW and what was, what was upgraded and what was new and so forth. This school right here, from a formal standpoint, some of the infrastructure of this water source system has never really been upgraded. It's, it's old. I know, I know you probably have heard that, but when you look at the OW and you look at this school, they were both built relatively the same time frame. This school's systems is probably in, in worse shape than OW's. So, I mean, because you didn't talk a lot about Edgefield High School. So, it, it's in looking at these systems, you've got a substantial amount of upgrades that need to be done here in this system, too. So, you're exactly right. So, I, I spoke about Edgefield, maybe just not my name. Because the energy performance contract um, actually has all those things being addressed here at the high school. Um, I referenced it as, as all the existing facilities, so I, I guess it's a point of clarity since I'm standing in the space to say that's actually part of the actual plan here at this individual facility as well. We present
presented that plan and the layout of actually what schools would be getting what at our, at our previous board meeting. Um, and that information, I don't know. Well, one last question. <clears throat> of course, we've got a lot more opportunities coming up. How come we haven't really entertained seriously the thoughts like on Howard Park being K-8 school? And because the opportunity in Orangeburg with the seven-year-old schools, if you're going to go to, to the point of renovating or building new schools, to close the schools, there's six elementary schools that we have here. I mean, it, it's the opportunity is there. I'm not sure why. You know, the, it's like maintaining the park. We have to maintain the facilities, whether we, it's a new roof or something. But when it comes time for construction, you know, you've got to look at the whole thing. You may have to tear it down to, to get the new. So, just want to make sure point clear. Um, to say why hadn't those things been done, it's just not an accurate statement. They actually have. When I first got here, the board was considering making Howard a sixth grade campus. So there have been other um, variations that have been an actually young um, presented. So in regards to resources, as this young lady spoke of, and as this gentleman spoke of in regards to teachers, the benefit when provided to have all elementary school teachers in one building, it gives access for flexibility with the same grade bands. Um, we do multi-level school systems well. Did I say it was not a challenge? It's a challenge. Mm -hmm. But the more fourth grade teachers I have in the same building, as opposed to spreading them across multiple buildings, could present a little more challenging impact. That if we have an opportunity to put one or two more students in that ensure they have a certified teacher, but if they have another building, then I'm back to a circumstance where I may have to ship a kid out of their zone to have access to that teacher. So there's some benefits, again, programmatically that would help that too. But we have considered different options uh, in doing that. And making look at the K-8 facility was actually one of them that we tossed around. But again, looking at the comprehensive picture, not just about the facility, but also program offering for students is something that we have to consider as well. But I like the, I'm glad you're sharing those, those, those ideas so we can go back and make sure that we have someone who shares the same compassion and thoughts about it. All right, one of us is more for information, whatever, and looking and reading some of the um, facility studies. I know um, Bowman and Bransville. I noticed that in the study it said that student population, that I think they were like 1,300 students, somewhere there about, if I'm thinking correctly. What specifically are you referring to? Bowman and Bransville. Bowman and Bransville? Yeah. When you look at Bowman, if you're looking at a K-12 campus, so what you've yeah. done is looked at the facility and added the elementary building and the um, fourth yeah. together. If you separate those at the maximum capacity, you will have about 600, I believe 54 at the high school and roughly around 600 capacity at the elementary school. Fourth yeah, campus. but the, the study said, and I, I guess my point gets to it, I think the study said about roughly 1,300 students uh, for the capacity of it. I know Bowen, when it was constructed, it was designed and built for a thousand students. So I'm wondering how they came up with the 1300 when it was designed for the school was actually a thousand students. So, great point. And that's accurate, what you said. Because in the study, it also says a maximum capacity. So just to get in the weeds just a little bit. You have a maximum capacity versus operational capacity. As I've said during the other meetings, Yes, at a maximum capacity, it would hold 1,300. But an operational capacity, because every single classroom is not full in every single period of the day, is about 8%, which would put us around 8,000 students at an operational capacity. So what you said was exactly right. The number that we provided, as I said here, at a maximum capacity. So we would never utilize a maximum capacity for school. At that point, you're bringing in more than one. So what you said is exactly right. About 1,000 students would be the operational capacity. Yeah, the design capacities are based off of operational capacity because your core spaces and your kitchens have to be built. I mean, you know that. So that, that's where it is. So you just confirmed exactly what the actual study referenced. Yeah, right. all. So yes, these are maximum capacities on your survey, not operational. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Question. Um, at, at school, when you were talking about um, drop-off points at 
Clark. Will there be a uh, fix for the drop-off point at Edisto Middle School? Because the traffic is actually in the road. You mean it actually you blocks. We have all the traffic at Edisto? No. Yes, we do. A lot. Um, those are things we're going to have to consider as well. Um, I know it's terrible out there. When, when I go, yeah, it, the stacking space is the road. Um, we have to look at any opportunities that we have, but all those things we have to consider in, in this plan for, for any of our students. So again, we have to look at those options for upgrades and renovations. So the hope for the resolution would be upgrades to existing facilities so that we can go in, see what our budget um, would allow us to address. Can we address everything, ladies and gentlemen? I'm gonna tell you right now, no, we will not be able to address every single thing. Um, just a suggestion, it would be very good if the bus transportation system could be able to call parents if we were doing investments to let the parents know that the bus is running late. There are some kids who parents are having to get drop off at eight or later at schools because there is no calls, no robocall going out to parents saying bus 26 will be running late. So can we get, um, that can be a suggestion also is, you know, making sure we ensure that the parents are aware. Because you have working parents, and you have to find neighbors, you have to find people who ride by seeing kids out there waiting on a bus, and there's no report that the bus is running late. Great point. Um, there's some things we, we can do even better than, than a robot call. There are technologies out there, and again, it just takes time to get this, um, and I'm gonna shoot myself in the foot. I'm just gonna tell you some opportunities that are there. Not saying this is what we're gonna do, but in the prior life, there's an app you can go Google, it's called Here Comes the Bus. All it is is an Uber app for the school bus. We have the routing system already in place. Um, when I was in Aiken, I installed this app where a parent can log on and you can see when the bus is coming. You can see when the child is dropped off. There are opportunities for that. It just takes time to get around to address those things. Um, maybe that was one to hear, but I'm a realistic individual. I can't tell you I can fix it all. Just snap it. No, that's me. fine. As long as we can get something in place, that would be perfect. My next question is piggybacking on what he's saying. Um, is it a, a possibility with kids moving with the schools that you're saying that you want to consolidate? Would it, would it be any overcrowding at any of these schools that we are looking at over um, the capacity limit for those schools? Right now, no man. Um, a, a optimal actual utilization versus capacity is anywhere between 85 to 90%. Um, that means you can maximize program offerings. I have enough students to make a course that I may not necessarily have in a smaller setting, so kids are not offered that. So you're toying with the actual utilization of the building. Um, this gentleman, he's, he's very astute when it comes to maintenance issues, but most HVAC systems are designed for human body capacity and heat in the actual design. So just having people there makes the function the way they should when you talk about um, commissioning any HVAC units and things like that. I'm an old operations guy, so I kind of enjoy this kind of stuff to a degree um, in that regard. Yes, sir. My last and final question would be, um, do Orangeburg, um, do this school do, do our area offer PACE program for individuals who have their teaching degree but just having difficulties with passing the exam? I know several people that are working at other agencies that you're saying the shortage that may be able to be, be referred if they could be on the PACE program. Send them to this general right here. Yes, ma'am. PACE is a statewide program yes. that, that's offered to all teachers okay. um, as well. So. Is on there, get her number, get her license tag, her address, everything we need to get, so she doesn't get away from us. Just to take off of what she was saying about HBAC and classrooms, one thing that would help, and it would be a big help, is that these units are designed in classrooms, they're designed for the classroom. They're not designed to heat and cool the hallways. So when we leave doors open in, in the classroom, we're actually hurting ourselves and, and causing units to work more. So it's very important for us to know and understand that these doors, not only from a fire code standpoint, but from an operation standpoint with these units, they need to stay closed. 
Great point. Um, and again, it depends on the system you have. A bar unit is just built for that space. And the DAB system, those kind of things would, would, would determine that. But right now, as a safety measure, we should close doors. Well, so, uh, we can yes, actually, sir. We can actually look online about the policy, yes. and we can tell if they have the windows open because the AC is not working. This gentleman is, is, is in our maintenance department, and he's one of our supervisors. And he can he actually is the in, individual responsible for monitoring the actual system. Um, in our studio, so he can share some of these things with you as well. We could actually get online if they call a problem with the heat or AC, and we can tell if they have a door open, a window, anything before we send a guy out there, a technician. And nine times out of ten, we can tell them to shut the window or the door, and the unit starts working properly. I can see you back again. I should acknowledge you before. So again, we're putting things in place. Um, as part of the, the um, performance contract controls, up, updated controls in, into those systems as well, are part of that as well. So this gentleman can pull out his phone, see and try to diagnose the issue, but also motion lights, you know, when people leave lights on, you know, if you sit too still, they'll cut off on you and you have to wave your hand. Those things are energy saving and conservation methods um, that we're hoping to put in place too. Um, uh, thank you for, for the presentation, it was awesome. Uh, but coming from, and we, our schools, I got two little babies, one is in uh, first grade and one is in kindergarten, and we want the best for them. Uh, God knows we want the best. Uh, growing up, I had to go to bowling school for a little while. And I had one little grandma over there to have you changing her house all night to one, two o'clock in the morning, you get up, you missed the school bus. So me and my little cousins, we would get out and we would walk, you know what I mean? And we had about four miles to walk to get to school. But we didn't want to sit around the house because she was going to make us clean up some more, you know? Saying that, <laughs> it say this, uh, in rural areas, like, you look at Bowen now, uh, and moving the school out, out of the town, one thing I can say about Bowman, they outshining everybody else in the county. You know, Bowman is was on a, a national scale. You know, I mean, it was recognized for their academics nationally, not just statewide, but nationally. So now moving to the rural areas, when you get kids like a me, yes, a lot more kids that maybe missed the bus. Uh, study also show I'm, I'm a part of the study. Uh, where rural South Carolina, and not just rural South Carolina, but rural America, transportation is one of the biggest issues that we have uh, in our infrastructure. Infrastructure, you know, the, the infrastructure of the buildings, the edifices, all those can look good, but the people, getting the people to Back and forth, you know, and this is this is one thing that I would want to see y'all work on. How could you put anything in place if you move these schools out and, and you move them out of these towns and mama's going to work, grandma's are, are responsible, they don't have no transportation. How could we have a system if the kids miss the bus? Uh, to, to get them to school. I mean, how could you get them to these places? And, 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 and what I'm saying is, when you move the school out of the town, you, you, you hurt the town as well. You know, you, you hurt local mom and pop businesses. You hurt so many people that it's nothing. Right? Okay, you know, my child with the bus. Okay, they about to go to school, jump in the car with them. You know what I mean? But when you move them, you know, you, you, the biggest thing is transportation. You know, I mean, and, and, and that's where I'm at right now. Um, how could we put, I, I'm all about education. Anything that we can do to better our schools, to better our system, get more, like I think out here in Edisco, you know, I, I mean, we can go, we, that, that can be the next question. But how could you, as a, as a superintendent, and, and this is a jewel that I'm giving you, you know, how could we have a system in place that can 
come back around. And, I mean, you know, if my baby, my child missed the bus, you know, and you got a grandparent that's, that's tank, don't, you know, transportation is a problem. I mean, that's the biggest thing that America has, rural America. Let me help you out here, Mr. Gaston. Okay. Um, the only schools and the only area that's being impacted is the eastern part of the county when you talk about that. The other claims, proposed options, don't have that impact. So even in the eastern part of the county, it's a positive impact. Because right now, if you're in elementary school and your brother or sister is in middle school or high school, guess what I have to do? A bus goes there, the bus hustles to drop it off at elementary school to hustle back to the house to then go back to the high school. But in our bail schedules for our multi-level facilities, all those schools are on the same bail schedule. So instead of you having to send buses back and forth when there's a bus driver shortage, you get on the bus with your brother and sister and y'all all ride to the same end destination, which would be at the legendary campus. So therefore, it makes it more efficient and it accesses and utilizes our school buses that are offered through the state in a more efficient manner. So with that change, there's no need to send a elementary school student to the elementary school, go back home to the high school to drop them off next door. Right. So it helps in that regard. But truth be told, we're not gonna have all the answers to all the issues. I'm just not that good. So, uh, so, so uh, <laughs> says, I'm not that good to have all the answers. But I said this one time, if I said it a million, it takes everybody. It takes a parent being responsible and getting the child up and getting them ready. It, it takes the principal. Okay. It, 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 it takes the work. I mean, somebody watching, you know, you got to look at it now. You know, we, we in a property county. I mean, you know, you, you, a lot of us are leaving and yeah, we can, we can write. A, a perfect picture, and in the perfect world, you know, everybody can, but when you're talking about kids, and you're talking about, you know, they're they not, they, they, like I said, they're not responsible. I mean, you know, mom, I'm dad, about dad. Is right, right. But, but this is who is affected, mm -hmm. you know. So, so I, I mean, and even with a place like Bowman, you look at how when you took the school out, now that ain't really, it's nothing there, you know, I mean, you know, so how can we put, uh, Put things back in place, and you was giving some good ideas and give some good points. I'm a mentor. We do so much with so little, you know. <laughs> Let me say that again. We do so much with so little, you know. So we 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 do with, without the help of the good Lord, we'll be struggling with what we do to help our youth. So, Kevin, I'll, I'll say this: you have some representatives who Bowman is near and dear to those, and. and we talked about that conversation. I wasn't here when that transition happened. Right. But I also believe, if I'm not mistaken, there were some, some positives. That it's a part of it. They ran nationally. I mean, yeah. I don't think no other school in or very county, and, and I ain't talking nobody. I mean, you know, but on the scale that they're on and what they're doing, I don't know what it is. You know, I know, I know what they used to do. I don't know exactly where they're at right now. But what they had in place, I mean, they was national in rank. So let, let, let me let me land this plane for you, for you, Kevin, in that regard. At the end of the day, it's going to take everybody. It's going to take everybody. It's going to take the parents. So it's going to take us sitting down with the parent and being a partner. And for those that may not necessarily show the practice of responsibility, we have to help them see the benefit of getting your child up. No you child know. up behind. Those need additional support, but one thing we can't do, and one practice that I feel cripples a community and individual, we can't allow people to become codependent where everything is done for them and they don't have skin in the game because again, the value that they're able to look you in the eye and say, I had a contribution to the success of that child walk across the stage. If you're not careful and not hold everybody accountable to the same standard that we're trying to do you end up crippling that parent and ultimately that child. We want to be partnered with the parent and have a mutually beneficial relationship where everybody has equal amounts of skin in the game. And there may be days where I have to tear the head a little, but there may be days I have to ask the parent to tear the head a little. That, that, that's how 
successful communities operate, um, where one is not codependent on, on the other exclusively. And like you said, that responsibility of that child walking across that stage. Uh, and, and on the other hand, if you see a child that you had in your presence, and a lot of teachers can vouch for this, and you see them and they go get in trouble, and the judge give them 50 years of life sentences, and they, they don't make mistakes where they ain't never coming back. You know, you wonder, what more could I do? You know, it's, it's so much more that I could have possibly did. So we are all in this together, and I know everybody in this county would never oppose on, on not having the best education for our kids, and not having the best, but you you just gonna have to, we're gonna have to figure out a way where it can be fair for everybody. And, that, and that's, I mean, that's, that's, my, that's my last bill. I'm gonna just make it fair where it's fair for everybody. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm going to stay here for a little while, but I'm not going to make you and hold you hostage for staying here. If you have any individual questions, Larry, make sure you come up and see me before you leave. Um, but I thank you for being here. And I appreciate your attention and your time. That's the one thing I can't give back to you. That's the most precious thing someone can give is their time. When the sun sets on today, I can, can't give you today back. So thank you for investing your time and energy into hearing what it is we have to say. Please complete the actual survey so we can get your feedback. And I hope you enjoy the video to see the big picture of what it is we're trying to accomplish for not only this community, but also our students and teachers. So thank you all so much. I appreciate you.